I mean, electricity has doubled in price in California in the last seven years. California is always a leadership. Whatever happens in California ends up happening every place else. Get ready. As, as electricity doubles and quadruples in price, the inputs of making electricity are going to double and, and quadruple in price as well. Every day that goes by is a day we get closer to the ultimate reckoning of some forces that, that people, I don't think, understand. The stock markets may be in for a choppy few years ahead, and we may see a reckoning in the markets overall with inflation roaring back. What exactly does this mean? Let's find out with our next guest, Bill Smead, CIO and Chairman of Smead Capital Management. Bill has had over 40 years of experience in the investment management industry, having previously worked in roles at Wells Fargo as well as Smith Barney, among other firms. Bill sees these assets protecting you the best. Stay tuned to find out which these assets are. But first, a word from our sponsor, Moomoo. The Federal Reserve's preferred measure of inflation, the Core Personal Consumption Expenditures, or Core PCE Price Index, came in at 3.5% in October, down from 3.7% in September, and above 4% earlier in the summer. This downward trend in inflation has been apparent, and in fact, the Fed has signaled at its last meeting that rate hikes are over, likely, and they're expecting at least three rate cuts next year. With rates expected to fall, where then should you, as an investor, park your cash? Well, amidst these economic tides, our sponsor for today, Moomoo, offers a port of stability with its cash sweep rate of 5.1%. Now, with the Fed funds rate hovering around 5.25 to 5.5%, currently, Mumu stands out by offering a rate that's not just competitive, it's almost at the peak of the Fed funds rate. But here's the catch. This isn't going to last forever as the Federal Reserve wraps up its rate hike cycle. These hike rates are set to become a fleeting memory. In addition, new users can receive up to 15 free stocks by opening an account and depositing funds. Canadian users and Australian users can enjoy different welcome bonuses as well. Click on the link in the description down below to find out more. You can then decide when to trade, but don't miss out on the big bonuses. Bill, welcome to the show. It's good to host you today. Thanks for having us. Bill, I want to start with some projections by some large uh, banks. Bank of America, for example, uh, their global research team is calling 2024 the year of the landing. I'll just read you a paragraph from this particular research report. A lower inflation around the globe should allow central banks to cut rates, while U.S. equities may reach a record level of 5,000 on the S&P by year end. They're talking about uh, year end 2024. They're saying 2023 defied almost everyone's expectations, recessions that never came, rate cuts that didn't materialize, bond markets that didn't bounce, except in short-lived vicious spurts, and rising equities that pained most investors who remained cautiously underweight. We expect 2024 to be the year when central banks can successfully orchestrate a soft landing, though recognize that downside risks may outnumber the upside ones. Let's address these assumptions and ultimately their call of 5,000 points of the S&P by year end. Do you agree? Well, we are not market timers. And uh, other than 43 years in the investment business, I don't consider myself any better at telling people what the market's going to do every six to 12 months. In fact, I commented to someone in the office a day or two ago, if you'd have told me that we were going to revive the excitement about the uh, largest and most popular tech companies, and we would be ahead 17% this year, uh, I'd have laughed and said, are you kidding me? Uh, uh, so we started our mutual fund on the second trading day of 08. So we're lousy market timers. <laughs> <laughs> we got our head beat in for the first 14 months. So when somebody looks uh, on January 3rd, we will have a 16 year track record in the fund. That includes literally getting annihilated the first 14 months out of the gate. So when you look at our track record that we got off to. A... So to answer your question this way is every day that goes by is a day we get closer to the ultimate reckoning of some forces that, that people I don't think understand. First of all, we have been more optimistic about the economy than most people. Now, most people think that that would make you more optimistic about the stock market. But in 1999, Warren Buffett went up to the Allen & Company Summit and he said, look, the economy grew 
from 1964 to 1981, it grew 4.3% a year. And the Dow Jones Industrial Average couldn't get above 1,000 for 17 years, which, by the way, used to be the primary benchmark uh, in, in the stock market. The Dow was at that time. And then he said from 1981 to 1998, the stock market soared and economic growth was only 2.7%. So what, what, what he was trying to explain to people is there isn't a correlation between strong economic growth and stock price performance. That, that is, it, it's inversely, it's inversely related. Stock market likes low growth, friendly Fed, lower interest rates, and people will pay up for a publicly traded business when business is not that great on the ground. But when business is great on the ground, business owners will sell common stocks to invest in warehouses and buildings and more employees and equipment, et cetera, et cetera. So people have forgotten all about this because interest rates went down constantly from the time I got into the investment business in 1980-81 to about a year, year and a half ago. So they, they haven't had to deal with an environment where the, uh, uh, the, the Fed is not friendly. Uh, okay, Bill, can we just back up a minute? What do you, what do you mean when you said that uh, most people were expecting the economy uh, to do a lot worse? So you weren't one of them? No, uh, we have argued for, gosh, five plus years that once we actually got the millennial group kicked into gear, that it was going to be almost impossible to have a lousy economy because their spending was going to move from discretionary. And let me take you back 10 years. 10 years ago, the place to be was owning the Starbucks and the Disney's and the and and the and the Home Depots, et cetera, that 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 uh, enjoyed the discretionary spending travel, American Express travel. That's what they wanted to do. But that was discretionary spending. Now they're getting married. They're having kids and they're pivoting to necessities and necessities are they have a much larger multiplier effect in macroeconomic terms than discretionary spending does because ca carpenters and plumbers and electricians and people that work in factories, et cetera, are, are gaining the benefit of that economic activity. And that's where we're headed. We're headed for a stronger economy. 180 million of the 330 million people in the United States are under 40. So that means much of economic activity is ahead of us, not behind us. We're a big group. I'm a baby boomer, but unfortunately, we're, we're dying. Uh, the older end of our group is dying. So we are going to get de-emphasized. The prior largest group of people was us. We're going down, and the 25 to 40 group is exploding. Exploding in which way? So you're talking about long-term demographic trends, right? I, I, uh, I just want to focus on next year for now. Okay. Uh, not, so, just, so, yeah. yeah. So your question was, how come people were calling for a recession in 2023 Correct. because of the tight credit? And why are people calling for a soft landing or, or uh, no recession next year? If we don't have a recession next year, it will be because of a set of countervailing forces that offset the normal negative impact of the tight credit. I understand. And so those, when you're, so when you those, talk about the reckoning, then what what are you referring to? Well, that the 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 positive forces are demographic, which is too many people with too much money chasing too few goods, and then the other uh, factor that's offsetting what normally tight money would have done is there is still a massive amount of liquidity, monetized federal government indebted liquidity floating around out there that everyone's playing with in business, whether it be subsidies for money losing environmental stocks or whatever it is, there's just a massive amount of what, what we like to call the Inflation Creation Act out there. The Inflation Creation Act? <laughs> did, you, did you coin that term, Bill? I did. Is that What do you mean by that? Can you elaborate? Well, what happens when you take a trillion dollars of federal government monetized stimulus and pour it into a system that already had $10 trillion of two different presidential administrations pouring in stimulus 
to get us through COVID. So let's recap your assumptions for uh, your outlook next year. You're suggesting that inflation will return. We'll, we'll, we'll elaborate on that in just a bit. And you're suggesting that economic growth will continue to expand, perhaps yeah, we, even more so than this year. Yeah. Yes. We took a look at a chart recently and went back and studied the 1970s because that's the most analogous time period to what we're going through now. Uh, there were two huge pullbacks in inflation in an era that ended up being defined by its outlandishly high inflation. And that would be in 1973, we had dropped from 6% inflation in the prior year or two down to three. Then we went to 11 and then it pulled back to five in 1977. And then it went to 14% in 1980, 81. So even a decade that inflation was a dominant economic force, there were two big pullbacks in inflation in that decade we're in the first of the two pullbacks right now. Yes, but Bill, in, in the late 70s, we had an oil crisis, right? We had a huge supply shock. It wasn't, it wasn't a monetary issue. So is it, are, are you suggesting we, we're going to we, get we don't similar now? again? We don't now? But the, crisis, the crisis is we are making every attempt to cause fossil fuels to be massively scarce and the body politic is trying to shame people in, in, into getting away from them before they realize that 41% of electricity is made with fossil fuels. So if you go to all electric vehicles, all you're doing is just going to send the price of electricity soaring. That's probably one of the charts we sent you. Do you do, so you think inflation is going to come back next year or the year after? Is it going to take some time? Uh, what, what's your view there? Well... I, we think that psychologically, what people pay for gasoline is the single biggest psychological factor in inflation. It, it's not important from a household spending standpoint. Gasoline, as a percentage of household spending, is at the low end of the last 60 years. It's like 3% of personal consumption expenditures. And it used to be six, right? So, so uh, that is that is uh, a very important factor in here. But the psychological side of it is, for the average American, it is their inflation gauge, right? And it was you go to the pump, and it was a buck more than it was uh, uh, two, three months before, and all of a sudden you're worried about inflation, or you go there lately in the last three or four months, and the price of gasoline's way down, you go, oh, we, we don't have an inflation problem. So it's, it's only a psychologically important marker. And the problem is, it's a marker that over the next 10 to 20 years can't possibly do anything but go up. So the psychology that's fine right now will be uh, bedeviled when we go where we're going. I mean, electricity has doubled in price in California in the last seven years. California is always a leadership. Whatever happens in California ends up happening every place else. Get ready. As, as electricity doubles and quadruples in price, the inputs of making electricity are going to double and, and quadruple in price as well. And, and, and gasoline will follow or lead this doubling and tripling in price? Actually, 40% of it's natural gas. Okay. And, and all we need right now is for it to get bitterly cold in New York City. You think our wages, uh, we'll start tracking from the markets for just a bit. You think our wages will keep up with the rising cost of energy? And uh, uh, we, we, you know, we believe somebody's... that that the winners of the next 10 years will be real assets and commodities that defend you from inflation and labor, uh, uh, skilled, low skilled and unskilled labor are the big winners of an inflationary decade. Just go to your favorite restaurant and ask them what they're paying compared to two years ago. They're going to be the winners. Why is that? Because their pay is going to go up faster than inflation. Yeah, we've been okay. telling people we've been we've been telling people for uh, the last three or four years we've been short coders and long carpenters. All right, interesting. So you're not you're not concerned about robots or AI uh, or any of that sort taking over these jobs. 
Uh, you, you're going to get me in one of the things I'm making a lot of fun of these days. Okay. Okay. Please. So, by all means. So, let, let, let me pivot real quickly. Uh, yes. In November of 2021, Charlie Munger said, this is the biggest financial euphoria episode of my career because of the totality of it. Now, he's a Harvard-trained lawyer. What do you mean by that? He means the 1% money, right? We had 1% money for many years in a row. The 1% interest rate on federal government debt uh, fed uh, a mania in the stock market, a mania in FANG stocks, a mania in uh, meme stocks, SPACs and IPOs, Beyond Meat, Peloton, and high price to sales stocks. Uh, you know, you name it, uh, cryptocurrencies, you name it, okay? And, and and so what he meant by that is effectively we did the 1636 tulip mania and the 1720 South Sea bubble at the same time. The totality of it, okay? So what I think happened is about a year ago, the, the big leaders of the technology companies, you know, the the people that run Google and Facebook and Microsoft and Amazon and they, the Apple, they got together and said, gosh, this is so much fun. I mean, we're just killing it. We're getting so rich and all of our investors are getting rich and everybody loves this. And Americans own the most stock. I think 41% of, of, of uh, assets in the United States are now in common stock. This is just great. How can we keep this going? And they said, let's tell people that AI is a brand new thing. So they did. Even though IBM competed on Jeopardy in 2011 and has been running Watson commercials for the last 12 years. It's a brand new thing. No, all these guys have been using it already. I, you know, I'm sitting here yesterday and I'm talking to somebody about something. Next thing I know, a, a, something pops up on my Apple device Bill, let's just go back to inflation for just a minute. If you don't think inflation is going to stay low, if it's going to return at some point, do you think that the Fed will still pivot in 2024? Uh, the Fed will pivot, and that's what will cause the inflation to come back. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I, I was I spoke at an at a event in Houston about a month ago with Jeremy Siegel, the Wharton professor and, and yes. stocks for the long run guy. He said... This, or maybe it was two months ago. He said, I think in 18 months, the Fed funds will be 3.5% and the long treasury will be four. He said that when, when the long treasury is like 475, or, you know, 10 year treasury. So, so here's the deal. Just think about this for a minute. Right now, we are at 3.85% on the 10 year treasury. We did a deep dive and asked the question, where are mortgage rates usually in relation to the 10-year treasury? This is a very important question uh, because the, uh, a pool of government-guaranteed mortgages, a Ginny May pool made up of FHA and VA loans, at, at the starting point has an average life of 11 years. So they've always priced mortgages off of the 10-year treasury. Because a mortgage pool of government guaranteed mortgages is backed by the same government that backs the 10 year treasury and it lasts an average of 11 years. So that average was 1.75%. We'll add 1.75% to 3.85 and you get uh, uh, 5.6. In other words, if mortgages right now were at an interest rate compared to history, in relation to the 10-year treasury, they'd already be at 5.6. Now, what do you think will be happening in the home purchase market the next time that all these young people that didn't buy a home at 5.6 go to buy a home at 5.6% mortgage rate? It is going to be an avalanche of buyers, an absolute avalanche. See, right now we're at about 665. Just just on that note, Bill, uh, with in, if mortgage rates come down to between five to six percent, wouldn't you expect more inventory to also come online? People now selling and refinancing or perhaps buying, you know, another home that they wanted to do, but they didn't want to do before when interest rates were higher because they didn't want to finance at another high rate. Well, first of all, almost all the homeowners have a three percent mortgage. 
and they don't want to give that up. Yeah. Okay. Secondly, secondly, the home building industry has completely changed in the last 15 years. They used to be land developers who made their money putting a house on a lot and getting a lot premium. They no longer are land developers and their market share is exploding on spectacular balance sheets with high margins and high return on equity. In other words, they are now the kind of company that Munger told Buffett that he wants to own. Hence, Berkshire Hathaway just this last year put a billion dollars into Horton, Lennar, and NVR, which happens to be exactly the three home builders that we have owned for a number of years. So you're right. But in 2024, for the first time by a long shot in history, one out of every two homes built in the United States is built by a publicly traded builder. Mom and pop got crushed in 08 and 09. There aren't any mom and pops anymore. It, it's too expensive. Where are you going to get to trade labor? Uh, where, where, where are you going to get the Whirlpool appliances? Uh, it is fantastic. So you could be right, but almost all of that has to be brand new homes because the existing homes are 45 years old and the millennials don't want the 45-year-old home. But whatever 45-year-old home they buy, they got it owned, go to Home Depot and we own that too. Maybe the 45-year-old homes are all that my generation can afford, Bill. <laughs> well, no, no, no. Actually, we have a theory on that too, David. We own U-Haul. What is what what does U-Haul help people do? Uh achieve their dreams. I don't know. <laughs> no, move around the country to find affordability. No, yeah. The millennial and, and how tied to a desk are millennials compared to prior generations? Yeah, it, it does occur to me that this work from home culture that is is more um, predominant now in our society and our countries, there uh, it, it's kind of we we're talking about how oil is a gauge for inflation. That's when everyone had to commute, right? That's no longer the case. Well, actually, there's more cars in operation than ever. People mm. aren't quite driving as much, but they've got one more car than they used to have. Yeah, OK, yeah. <laughs> I guess people have, uh, I don't know, people have more it, it's, disposable it's, income. It, it, it's, it's wild. Remember, the stock market, as interest rates went from 18% treasuries to half a percent treasuries, the stock market created a massive amount of wealth. And a lot of that wealth went into buying a third car called a Tesla or, or whatever. Yeah. So uh, just to summarize, then, we've talked about your views in the economy and your outlook on inflation. What is then your outlook on equities? I opened with the Bank of America outlook or their projection for 5,000 on the S&P. Are you bullish or bearish for next year on equities? I know you talked about how there could be a divergence between stocks and the, the real economy. They don't always correlate perfectly. In fact, you said they don't. So what's your view on the stocks? Uh, our view is that the S&P 500 is likely to have 10 to 15 year time period where it doesn't make any money. 10 to 15 years, just at the time that they have sucked the most people into thinking that is the end all, it will turn sour just like all other investment disciplines that got too popular. Okay, so let's talk about your preferred assets. You already said commodities, hard assets. In fact, I'm looking at um, Smeet Capital Management, your uh, 13F filings from September, your top holdings. We're, we're way overweighted in energy. We own uh, Oxy, uh, Conoco. Uh, uh, we, we own uh, Oventive, Apache, and Devon. We own the home builders. We have... Uh, between the oil and gas companies and the home builders, we have about 40% of our portfolio. We own Bank America, JP Morgan, and American Express because those are the financial institutions that the millennials prefer because they have the best mobile banking apps and they like the travel points at American Express because even when they get married and have kids, 
they still drag their little kids all over the place. So you're bullish on fundamentally the uh, the the rising wealth of the millennial generation. Yes, that- and the activity, the activity that is created by them forming households, buying houses, buying cars, and actually turning into adults at 30. What where are they getting this money from, Bill? I mean, we've just discussed how there could be an affordability issue with homes. Are they uh, are they really buying homes, Bill? Uh, I I came in I graduated from college with a 10 and a half percent unemployment rate. And you're mm-hmm. asking a guy in an era where uh, what's the unemployment rate right now? 3.7 yeah. or something like that? Yeah. Uh, you you answered your own question. They've all okay. got a job. All of them that want a job have a job. And if they're low skilled or no skilled, their wages are going up way faster than inflation. Mm -hmm. Uh, They're actually discovering that there's economics to cohabitating. What a novel thought. (laughs) Okay. And this is going to spur a boom in the housing market. What already is. Right. Okay. Look, the Fed just tightened credit from the mortgage. They took mortgages from 3% to 8%. And if you check the stocks, the, the market is anticipating a golden era of home buying, home, home building. If you're if you're invested, if you're long home builders, you're expecting new homes to come online, which is then assuming that these millennials are going to be buyers and not renters of existing homes. Is that fair to assume? Well, sometimes my my builder companies build communities for people that are going right. to rent them to people. Sure. Okay. Yeah, we, Fair we don't we don't care. We're making twenty five percent return on equity and own these stocks at nine times earnings, and there's one hundred and eighty million people below forty. Would you buy REITs, Bill? Well, we we own two REITs. We own Simon, uh, which has both Class A malls and premium outlets, mm-hmm. and then we own uh, uh, Mace Rich that owns Class A malls, and. As the millennials move away from the core, expensive downtown areas to the suburbs, that sends their shopping trips away from downtowns to the suburbs. Okay. We're, vertic- we're, we're very vertically integrated in our thinking. I was, okay, let's talk about real estate for just a minute then. New homeowners, I'm reading this headline from Newsweek that came out uh, December 7th. New homeowners lose $122,000 on average as housing prices drop. It's highlighting a few markets in the U.S. where housing prices are already dropping in the last quarter. Uh, 15 most affected U.S. markets with year, year-on-year year price drops for single-family homes. On this map, I'm looking at this map. It's it, it's large metropolitan areas. Is that happening right now? Home prices are dropping? That That's why our, that's why our suburban shopping experiences are going to get better because that's who's losing it is large cities. Downtown areas of large cities are dying. Uh, and, and they'll come back in a different way, but it won't be a residential way. Uh, so, so here's what you've got to understand. Diana Olick was on TV yesterday explaining that home prices went up this year, 4% on average. So your Newsweek people, it sounds to me like they're kind of cherry picking, uh, geographies. So, we don't believe they're going to go up everywhere. We think they're going to go up where there's affordability. And guess where our builders are building? They're building in. I, we went to a wedding in Yakima, Washington, which is in central Washington, one of the fruit growing capitals and agricultural capitals of the United States. And a sign outside of town said, brand new homes, uh, 1,700 square feet, starting at the 350,000 level. Well, guess what? That's an hour from the ski slopes, uh, an hour from water skiing on, on, on the lake behind the dam at the Columbia River, two hours from Seattle, beautiful four seasons, hot, dry summer, et cetera. Okay, why don't you move a bunch of employees of your business there and let them buy a $350,000 house? And that's going to be the pressure. That's, that businesses will adapt to the affordability. I, that's why I wanted to ask you because I'm not I'm not sure which data to trust or look at anymore. This article used the word free fall. It says property values are now in free fall, quote unquote. And then I'm looking at the Case Shiller Home Price Index, and that's still going up to new all time highs. So yeah, I don't know. Yeah. So so again, uh, now 
let me let me deal with the question we had three or four years ago all the time. Uh, the question we had three or four years ago was, where's the down payment going to come from? Okay, well, guess what? Every couple can give $36,000 per kid. Okay, so any grandparent, any newly minted grandparent will kill to have proximity to those grandkids. We have okay. twelve. We have twelve grandkids. You, well, congratulations! That must well, be keeping you busy over the holidays. It <laughs> makes me an expert. I have five millennial kids, three <laughs> millennial daughter-in-laws, a millennial son-in-law, twelve uh -huh. grandkids. I I don't have to pay a helicopter like the hedge fund guys do to find out what's going on in shopping. I just ask my wife. <laughs> okay. You've got a you've got an economic gauge right at home. Um, Bill, let's close off on specific assets that you like. We know you like energy. We know we just talked about the home builders. What about things like Bitcoin? Um, newly classified commodity, let's put it that way. Is that on your list? Well, I'm a big admirer of both Jamie Dimon and uh, Charlie Munger. Uh, let's see. Munger called it rat poison and... Uh, 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 Jamie Dimon called it something terrible here recently. So here's Jamie my... Dimon changed his mind. Well, no, 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 that was just recently. He said something right. really negative. So oh, he did. Okay. Here's my opinion. Bitcoin could possibly become an alternative currency the way that gold has served as an alternative currency for hundreds of years. In other words, it, it might be a better currency than paper dollars. Now, as an investment standpoint, gold has been a terrible investment over the last 250 years, but it's been 100 times better than a paper dollar. <laughs> right? So, so, okay, so Bitcoin can become an alternative currency that will be the definition of success for Bitcoin. It becoming an alternative currency. That will be success. It's, it, it's, it's the same kind of investment that gold is. It's only useful for speculating in the short run. That's, that's the only aspect of it as an investment because it, it's an unproductive asset. So far. Until no, it's, we have it's stationary. I mean... Right. Okay, I've got a Bitcoin. Okay, great. Well, a, a Bitcoin doesn't employ people. It doesn't pay dividends. It has no free cash flow. It's not. It's not. It's not a productive asset. It's you don't just, think we could transact? You don't think it could become a medium of exchange on yes, a wider scale? I'm saying if it's successful, it will okay. be a medium of exchange. But that's boring as all get out, right? That's gold. Right. 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 That's just boring. Um. Let's close off on your investment philosophy. You and I talked offline briefly before the tape started rolling. You were telling me about how uh, Munger had a slightly different approach than than uh, than 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 his counterpart Buffett. Uh, it, it, walk us through your logic here. So, what what is value as value investing in your in your in your eyes by by your definition? We like Buffett's definition, which is paying substantially less than what you're going to get in the future in the form of free cash flows. So what has become overly popular is buying the highest quality businesses and being willing to accept those future cash flows at high multiples. Let me just use an example. It, it's the mother Teresa of all common stocks, Costco. Costco is an incredibly good company, right? I, I don't deny that for a minute. My, my wife and relatives pound the daylights out of it, okay? But, but the stock trades at 35 times earnings. Now, it's never traded at 35 times earnings until just the last year or two. It's gigantic compared to what it was. What's the mathematical likely that the company, as big as it is now, is going to grow at anywhere near the pace it grew in the past? And the answer is, not likely at all. So why are they paying the highest multiple when the likelihood of growth is dramatically lower? And the answer is because interest rates were 1%. And it's the mother Teresa of all common stocks. Now, 
I'm not telling you to sell it. It's a wonderful company and all that kind of stuff. All I'm telling you is our stocks at an average of 11 or 12 times earnings generate a lot of the same return on equity and have the same kind of future growth potential that Costco does. But we're paying 11 or 12 times earnings for that future potential and people are paying 35 times. But they're not, are you saying, are they necessarily the best businesses? Uh, in some cases they are, but we own some of the best businesses at 14 times earnings like Merck and Amgen. And, and people don't care about that. I don't know. However you want to define low quality, a low quality business at a low valuation trading at a discount to peers. I ask this because you brought up a very good point. Buffett uh, has picked or you know, has a, had, had, had a track record of picking highest quality businesses. Finance 102, one of my second or third finance classes I ever took in my life. I was a teenager. Our finance prof told us not all good businesses make good investments. That's the philosophy that we were taught. Do you agree with that philosophy? Yeah, you can you can pay too much for a wonderful business. No question. Right. But uh, what's even more fun is in an era where real assets and inflation get going, you can end up with a high quality business that started out being uh, at, at very low commodity prices. Oxy was not a high quality business. But now you've got Warren Buffett, who likes to buy high quality businesses. Every time the stock drops below 60, he's loading up the boat. And, and because now it's a high return on equity company whose balance sheet is improving by the minute and gushes free cash flow and has a very bright future. The theme of our conversation is inflation returning for the, all the reasons you've listed in the last 30 minutes. What then is the best inflation hedge for you? Well, uh, for households, the best inflation hedge is a forced savings program called a mortgage owning a house on five to one leverage because the underlying asset, the land and the home is likely to appreciate at or above the rate of inflation, which will cause them to develop a, a, a significant chunk of net worth. For us, we want home builders. We want oil and gas. We want suburban uh, landowners like like uh, Simon and and uh, and Maestrich. And then we want companies that can suckle on this huge population group selling them necessities that have a tendency to also keep up with inflation. I've noticed you didn't say the S&P 500. I, I know you said that it's going to be choppy and sideways over the next 10 years or so, but you don't think businesses are inherently good inflation hedges? I mean, they have to raise their prices to keep the margins up, right? To stay in business. Jeremy Siegel covered that in his talk the other day. He said at 20 times earnings, you don't get an inflation hedge out of a portfolio of stocks. Mm. That's the S&P. At 11 times earnings, you get a nice inflation hedge out of a portfolio of stocks. Interesting. So he was recommending non-U.S., which we have through our 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 uh, value fund, and and and, uh, uh, and and we we our portfolio trades at about twelve times earnings in the U.S. fund. So we feel like we offer that hedge against inflation uh, in what we're doing. Excellent. Well, where can we learn more about your work, uh, Bill? I know you have a missive that we spoke about and referenced, um, and you you have your funds. Where can we learn about these funds? Smeedcap.com, and you just click on advice. And you can go in and put your email address in. You get our missives. We're doing a podcast. Cole runs that called A Book With Legs, named after Charlie Munger. His family said he, he he's always got his face in a book. He's a book with legs. Uh, and and then, uh, yeah, just go to our website. There's a, a lot of stuff there. And uh, it's all archived. And uh, we, we have a lot of fun. Well, that this was a lot of fun for me as well. Thank you very much for your talk uh, and for educating us. I'll speak to you next time. Happy New Year. Thank you. And thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and follow Smeet Capital in the links down below.